family, obviously to me, is the most important thing on earth. Uh, it's all I've known. I was one of eight children. Uh, my wife was one of eight children. All we've ever known is to share, you know, and be brought up in a family atmosphere. Uh, we have had 13 children. We've had uh, two of them married. One of them's getting married next year. We've had all kinds of events, birthday parties, christenings, confirmations, baptisms, uh, all kinds of sacraments have been celebrated with the family. And, you know, those are the fun, joyful times usually. Uh, we did lose one child. Um, he's our angel in heaven now. He was around for two months before we lost him. But uh, that was a devastating blow. And after having him, we still had five more children. So uh, it, it's been, there's nothing better than to have your family around. Well, I met Artie when I was 12, and Artie was 13. And we got married when I was 18, and he was 19. And now we have 13 children, and um, I think over 22 years, 13, yeah. Eight boys and five girls. There are a lot of people in the world that are very wealthy, materialistically, and, uh, but, but in the end, you can't take it with you. And I want to give everything I can to my family, and most importantly is to pass on the faith to them because that's what God put us here for. It's a legacy, and it's a, a legacy that you can actually take with you. And there's not a lot that you can take with you from this earth into paradise. But I think, you know, I've got quite a, a group that I hope is coming with me. I played sports when I was a young person and uh, loved playing sports. So that as I had children, they wanted to participate in different activities and we let them do everything. Whatever activity they wanted to play in or participate in, we, we let them and oftentimes you, you, had, you had to coach because that was just part of the deal. And, and I ended up coaching soccer and basketball and hockey and baseball, football, everything there was to coach and I loved every minute of it and I'm still doing it. You know, with 13 kids, you do this for a long time. You know, my dad would coach my basketball teams, um, coach the boys hockey, so every day after dinner we would, you know, uh, throw the baseball around in the backyard, um, or we'd play hit the bat, or, you know, something like that. We'd play horse. I remember still the first time I beat my dad at horse. <laughs> it was a snowstorm. <laughs> I kept telling him that had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I think I was 14 or 15 or something. Um, so a lot of just playtime. You know, things like that. We used to go skating on the ponds in the winter and um, fish in our backyard. There was a pond in the backyard at one point. We moved a lot because every time we'd have a couple more kids, we'd need a bigger house. He wanted to be able to have plenty of time to spend with the children. So, and he, he won't put that out of balance. You could not tell him that he was going to work from 5 o'clock in the morning until, you know, I, I, we have neighbors who've left the house at 5 or 6 in the morning and they don't get home until 7 or 8 at night. And Artie would never sign up for that job. He, doesn't, he, he drives to the bus stop as often as I drive to the bus stop. Granted, it's 6 o'clock in the morning, but he wants to pick them up from practice. He wants to see their practices. He wants to coach them on teams. He wants to have dinner with them. You know, and I just remember a lot of just sort of central family home sort of things. You know, we had dinner together, and of course we needed two tables. And as we got older, sometimes we ate in two shifts. The younger kids would eat, and then the older kids would eat. But um, you know, I think it was very typical sort of family. My, my, mostly my dad would work and my mom would stay home. Uh, occasionally my mom would do different jobs. She was an um, aerobics instructor for a little while and she supervised the gym for a little while. But as there got to be more children, that became, I think, a little bit more difficult. So she stayed home. My dad would work, but he would always be there for all the games and, you know, anything we needed with that. Activities have always been my thing. Julie, Judy's always been uh, the academic in the family. And so, she, you know, as, as a team, we work well together that way. And she's, she's done a great job academically, and I think I've done a decent job athletically with the kids. He doesn't have an ego when it comes to affluence, but he has a tremendous pride in his children and their athletic ability and their ability to, you know, survive in this crazy world. And he thinks it takes a tremendous amount of nurturing, and he takes it to heart. My parents always, always would sacrifice and put us first. You know, they always would um, 
whatever they needed, it really was, came second. It was always just for the good of the family, for the good of the kids. Get me to go to the college that I wanted to go to, which was sort of financially out of reach. And um, it was never a question. You know, you can do whatever you want to do and we'll make it work. And, you know, through the grace of God, it all worked. You know, sometimes the month is still here and the money isn't, you know. But it's, um, we don't have anything stored up in barns anywhere. We've used everything we have. But that being said, we have everything. We have more than most anybody. And greater than that, they've had him. Always they have had him. And um, I think that's one of the greatest gifts you can give your kids is, you know, yourself. My high school sweetheart was Artie's younger sister-in-law, Judy's younger sister. And Rita and I have been together since I was 16. I'm 52 now, so Artie and I go way way back uh, you know they're two of six uh, two out of six sisters they're very very close so because they spent so much time together Adi and I spent an awful lot of time together and thank God we got along so over over the years we've become the best of friends because he's such a likable guy because everybody who's ever met him likes him <laughs> everybody thinks they're his friend you know because he he is very genuine Oh, he's a great guy. He's very competitive. We play a ton of golf together. He is a little better than me, unfortunately. However, there is, you know, that's why there's handicaps in golf. So we have some excellent matches. Uh, we are, not only do we compete against each other, but we probably have the most fun when we team up and compete against others. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's a great athlete. He's a great family man, obviously, a father of 13. Um, he's a great guy. We realized that my dad was sick when we would, um, I mean, he would just tell me about different things that were happening, and um, he doesn't usually say when he's in pain. You know, he's a typical guy that way. Artie was uh, starting to lose weight and having problems golfing. He, and also, um, he was much more agitated than normally. And I thought, you know, it's unusual for him to, to be so short with, with things and have little patience with things. And he went to a doctor, he saw the doctor several times, and the doctor was not giving us any diagnosis for what was wrong. And we noticed that he had lost some weight, and we noticed that he was tired, and my mom started telling me a little bit about how he had gone to the doctor, and he went to see a GI doctor, a gastroenterologist, which is to look in your gut, basically. Um, and they said, because he had had heartburn, and they said that he had some problems with some inflammation in his throat. Well, based on, and then he was anemic also, his blood count was low. And so he said, well, they think I'm really this tired because, and so then I, I you know, it was sort of interesting timing because before that year, I never would have known what to ask. I never would have been able to say anything really, except, you know, I hope that they're right, <laughs> you know? But just because of where I was, they had been teaching me about all the questions that you ask and doing what they call differential diagnosis, which is with this symptom, what are the things that could cause it? And so when he came up with the anemia and then he told me about what the gastroenterologist had told him, um, it just didn't, knowing him and knowing how much he didn't complain about things, it didn't jive with me. And so he went to get his um, studies and they said, oh, I'm, I'm bleeding a little bit there. They think that's why I'm anemic. They want me to come back in six months. But then he, when you talk to him, um, when all of us would talk to him, he couldn't walk through a round of golf. You know, he was so tired and he had lost over 30 pounds, I think, and he, he looked different. And this was my dad, he was alive, he was vibrant. He, was, he would wake up at five in the morning and take us to the swim meet or to the hockey game or to the basketball game or whatever we needed to go to. So um, the fact that he couldn't get up and play golf, I mean, he, he's laid up on the floor and he goes to the hockey game, you know? <laughs> there was nothing that was gonna make him miss um, the things that he really loved to do. So when he, he said he wasn't able to do that, to me that was a big red flag. And I knew that even though he mentioned that to his physicians, they wouldn't understand what a big deal that was. Um, so at that point, I sort of started to become more nervous. He was consistently losing weight. It's funny how golf continuously plays a theme into this, but I can remember he'd be, you know, we'd go and play golf and he'd be okay for the first half a dozen holes and then he'd be very much not like him, you know, 
he would only be like he was he, he was too weak to even put a good swing on the ball and then on the back side you know on the last nine holes it was just uh he was just dragging himself around you know and also we were watching him lose this tremendous amount of weight he was going to a local hospital a suburban hospital nearby trying to get a diagnosis and i think they had given him a diagnosis of like a, you know influx or um, you know something acid reflux or something like that and you know he the, the thing that reader and i were talking about is um that at least it wasn't anything serious because they would have caught it, we assume, because so much time had gone by. As he continued to lose weight, things started to get more evident to me that, you know, this is something serious. It's your whole personality has changed, your whole dynamic of, of what you're interested in has changed, and it, it began to be a little scary to me. So we started talking, he and I and um, my mother, and, and just decided that probably six months was too long to wait that we needed to do something sooner than that because um, we just had a sense that there was something else going on. So the original doctor that had given him to a different doctor who, you know, they were kind of passing him around, we broke that cycle and we decided to go into Boston and, and to get a um, diagnosis in Boston. And uh, that's where he was diagnosed with kidney cancer. And he called me, he was leaving Boston, he called me when I was back in New Jersey, um, which is where I was training, to tell me that they had called him in and they sat him down and they told him that he had cancer. So then I became furious because one, probably I was just scared and upset, but I was furious that he was by himself and he was in Boston and there was nobody there with him. And, you know, and he's telling me he just got this diagnosis. He feels like he got hit by a truck. He thinks, what does this mean for my family, for all my children? I have all these children I have to support. And, um, you know, what am I going to do? Well, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I, the last thing I thought about was me dying because um, I could kind of deal with that on my own you know with myself and with my God I was petrified for Judy and the kids because I had no idea 13 kids I mean if I were gone she would have had a decent start but after that who knows what would have happened and to raise now that we know what we know raising these kids and especially the boys the last three of boys and it would have been a chore for her I'm not sure she would have enjoyed it so much. And it's, uh, so my fear was for her and for the kids. You know what, the diagnosis will blow you away. It will just, you know, for me, it put me into, I would say like a shock. Um, prior to that, I was very, uh, I was advocating for him. I was looking for a better doctor. I was looking for um, a better hospital or a way in to get into the best. When they gave me the diagnosis, I, I froze. And we had a business trip to Hawaii, and I can remember this as clear as day that um, we came back from Hawaii and the diagnosis had taken place that, um, and I ended up hearing it um, that morning at, at, on the, at the bus stop went through and, and we literally got it, Rita, I went and grabbed Rita, we only live a half a mile apart. And went over there, we flew into the house at 8.15 in the morning, chaos is going on, trying to get there. We are like, what is going on? And they shared the news with us. Now they had had a couple of days to get used to the news before we, and we were just, we were basket cases. It was terrible. Um, you know, it was a cancer diagnosis and it was, um, you know, we were, unfortunately we went, I went, you know, right to, expecting the worst, you know. At that point, kind of the world stopped for everybody. I often tell people I, I could see the hearse going down Main Street in my mind. And I thought, this is all wrong. Um, and of course, I immediately went to researching what that meant. You know, what is the treatment? What is the protocol? What is the statistics for what happens in the next five to 10 years? And, um, and that became more upsetting because, you know, with kidney cancer, which is what he had, um, the prognosis is terrible, you know, 5% after five years survive, you know, um, if, it's, if it's not encapsulated, which means if it's beyond the kidney. Um, so that was very difficult because I felt like now I, I know enough to tell you what's wrong with you, but there's nothing that can help you, you know. 
I went to, you know, how could this be, and the questions of how could this be, how could it happen to this guy, you know, Lord, how could he, he's a father of 13, what's going on here? Because, you know, probably I, I had him as terminal, you know, he was diagnosed with kidney cancer. And then as we got into it a little bit more, you know, it was a grapefruit, a softball size, grapefruit size tumor or something, and they weren't sure you know, what other organs had been attacked or attached, this tumor had attached itself to. You know, going into the surgery, there was a lot of unknown questions. And, um, you know, I was very worried. And so what, for, what he needed to do next, you know, was a difficult thing. Because if you go to the traditional medical doctors, you take out the kidney, you see if it's spread. If it's spread already, you don't take out the kidney. There's really nothing to do. Chemo and radiation don't work. What do you do? if you've already got metastasis. So based on the CAT scan, it looked like it had already spread. Um, and so, you know, what do you do? And, and I remember deep prayer, sitting alone in church in front of the tabernacle, speaking to Jesus and asking him. I remember laying down in front of the statue of our Blessed Mother at um, Resurrection Church, and I had a prayer card for each one of my children that I would say a little novena for each one of them. And I laid each one of the cards on the ground in front of the statue of Our Lady. And I said to her, I'm, I'm going to be like Abraham. I'm going up this mountain with you, and I'm going to offer him to you. I will lay him right here on your altar. And if you take him, I'm just going to ask Jesus to walk me back down this mountain, because I can't do this on my own. And I know it's all in your hands. And I think that was at that point when I released him was when things started to, you know, change in my own heart. And I started to realize I need to get people to pray. I need to get a novena going. I need to let people know what people of faith do when they get a fatal diagnosis. What do we do? And I knew that people were looking at me because pretty much the whole parish and the whole town was praying for us by the time we finished. We had an all-night novena, we had, but we put it out there, which a lot of people with cancer don't do. A lot of people, I, I understand it because it's so frightening. It's almost like if we can keep it in this little, it's, we're gonna control it or contain it. If we let everybody know this, we're empowering the cancer. Where I felt more like, if I don't put this in the light and we don't all pray against it, I have a whole team out here that I can get praying with me. <laughs> And I'm going to, you know, enlist them all. And so many people came to our aid. So many people prayed with us and for us. That was an incredible experience for me. He had kidney cancer. That's what, you know, um, and I can remember. So here's, here's what happened then is, uh, you know, the girls with the, you know, what an army the six sisters were, you know, that, you, you know, they all pulled together around Judy and they were storming the heavens. They turned to prayer um, immediately. They were dropping off novenas and churches. We were having all night vigils for Adi. We were, um, you know, I can remember Adi and I were coaching a hockey team at that point in time. Patrick, my Patrick and Adi's Timmy were playing on. And the whole team came in and, and put their jerseys on the front pew. It was just heartbreaking stuff. Uh, so everybody was praying for him. The surgery went very long. It was a very long surgery. And Artie was in recovery for a long time, too. And this is how serious it was, though. In the surgery, they had a pancreatic specialist in the OR. You know, they just don't have these guys hanging around for the sake of it. This is a guy who has obviously got you know, he's got stuff to do. And I think, you know, the pancreatic specialist was there because they would have thought, it, it, I think they had suspicions that it had attached itself or grown into, I'm not sure how that works, but uh, I knew that, you know, if it's, I mean, to me, cancer and pancreas is two words you don't want to put together, you know. Um. The surgery was very, uh, very difficult. But the surgeon did call me when, you know, you're in a, a room and there's a phone and they call you and tell you that, and he said, we, looks like we got all of it. Um, it was uh, longer than we expected. He's in recovery and, you know, within an hour or so you should be able to go up. He, the surgery was terrible. The um, anesthesia was terrible. 
Uh, he was groaning afterwards. He looked terrible after the surgery. When Judy got the call down, I was standing beside her in the, in the OR waiting room and she was talking to the doctor and he, and he said, you know, it was completely encapsulated, which was just the best news they could ever have. Kidney in the tumor was completely removed and it was encapsulated. But after that surgery and the doctor said he got the margins were clear, we were pretty excited. I felt pretty good and uh, kind of just moving on with life, going back into the work world and everything else. You know, he kind of went on and lived his life, as did I. We went on and, and lived our life. And we're going to heal now and we're going to go on with our life. And the healing process wasn't easy because they literally cut him from front to back. You know, it was, a, it was a huge surgery, and we knew it was going to take time before he gained weight, before he could go back to athletics. Or, but you sort of se sense that that's behind you now, except for the fact that they now need to continue to scan you, which is frightening, because you think every time they're putting you into a machine, what are they looking for? What are they going to find? So Adi has to undergo these scans. I think they were every three months in the beginning, and, um, you know, the first one's good, second one's good. The scans were clear. Then they scanned him again in August, and that's when they said, we're watching something here. He had to do his routine scans, and he would get anxious every time, just like anybody who has cancer. You know, you have to go through those yearly tests and those monthly tests and the blood work that you have and, until you're decidedly either cancer-free or need a new, you know. Um, so he was going through that, and at some point within the next six months or so, he had uh, CAT scan that showed that he had some nodules in his lungs and that it had spread. Now the kidney cancer prognosis to begin with um, wasn't good, but when you have multiple nodules in the lungs, there's no treatment. He's got these three nodules on his lung and then come to find out is, you know, if you have kidney cancer that metastasizes, apparently it goes to your lungs and your brain. So we got this news and that's like, it was worse than the first news. That's because metastasized cancer, as again, as I understand it, is it's not treatable by chemo. It's not treatable by radiation. It's only treatable by extraction. So they said, well, we have a thoracic surgeon that will actually, you know, go in and take your lung out and they started graphically explaining what they would do to see if there was um, cancer in these um, nodules in his lungs and you know you could have picked me up off the floor that day and Artie too Artie came out saying I'm not doing this because we you know went months of surviving you know and recuperating from the first surgery at that time my daughter Jennifer who is the doctor was with us with her husband and she pretty much told us that's what they're going to do. You know, we're not going to wimp out here. We're doing what they're telling us we're going to do. And the, the prognosis being so much worse, um, that became very stressful for, I think, the family as well as himself. And then what do you tell them? You know, there is no treatment for this. Well, you can do an experimental therapy, which I talked to him about. You can try interferon. It can make you very sick. You can get septic. You can be in the hospital. You can be in the ICU as a result of the medicine which is worse than chemo and radiation, but it is the only thing that they're using to treat it right now, and it's experimental, it's not proven. He says, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I said, well, you can't do nothing. I mean, they basically are gonna plan on opening them up and like they, gee, you know, they chainsaw your rib gauges or somehow get to your lungs, and they're gonna go in there and they're gonna cut out these three nodules, they're gonna put everything back together again, and off he goes until it shows up someplace else. You know, it isn't, it, there's nothing that's preventing it from, from spreading. So that was just terrible, terrible news. That was a death sentence. And that's, um, that's the way I looked upon it. Then the cancer came back in my lungs and it basically gave me a death sentence. And at that point I was like, oh my God, you know, I didn't expect this. So that was hard. That was really hard to overcome that one. And I already felt very depressed by that, thinking the rest of my life is going to be cutting parts of my body out. 
It was interesting because they are my parents and it, and it was my dad and it's, it's his right to know what the situation is. But at the same time, you know, when it comes to medicine, your mental well-being really has a lot to do with how you do. Um, and, and it's such an anxiety provoking thing. Of course, I don't want to be the one to tell him you're going to die. I mean, that's, I didn't know if it would be true, first of all. And second of all, um, it's such a devastating thing to say. Um, and then I, I think also I couldn't come to grips with it myself, of course, you know, I didn't want anything to happen to him. So I think it was very difficult just to even think about it as a reality, like you, you really could be very sick. So, as, as golf again kind of plays a, plays a role in this, I was invited to play in this member guest, a guy named Jack Bowman from the Cape. He invited this other guy from Hingham, a guy named Rob Griffin, and Dave Silk, the uh, ex-Olympic gold medal hockey player. So the three of us decided to meet. We're all South Shore guys, and we're heading to the Cape, and we're going to meet on the South Shore and drive down together. And I'm driving, and Robbie's in the back seat. And he asks how Artie is doing, because he knows, you know, we're brother-in-laws. And, um, you know, I told him what was going on, and he was just blown away because everyone had, you know, really... It was, you know, he, he thought that cancer was behind him, you know, life had gone on, life was going to be good. And Adi, and then Robbie, I mean, excuse me, Robbie spends, so we, we spend the next five or six hours together, we're in this golf tournament trying to compete, and Robbie and I happen to be in the same cot, and he shares with me a story that his dad had recently passed and he had tried to before he died, but it didn't work out because I think his dad's health failed quicker than, than he wanted. But he had try, he was going to bring him to this place called Medjugorje. So this was on a Thursday afternoon. And uh, we spent that whole day talking about Medjugorje and you know the, the other two guys Jack and Dave they must have been looking at us all day like what are these two guys doing but uh, I was intrigued I asked him questions Robbie was just filled with with wanting to share it and uh off we go. You know, we literally spent and then you know we had the the ride back home so we we were together for six, seven, eight hours that day. And, um, you know, if we were together eight, six of them were spent talking about Medjugorje. When we were in the back of the car, Kevin explained to me that Artie was very sick, told about the first situation, and said that he was in dire straits, that he'd lost 40 pounds, that he was going to be operated on, they went to break open his rib and take his lung, remove part of his lung, and that it just did not look good. And Immediately, I told Kevin about Medjugorje. He had not heard of it. I had never heard of Medjugorje before, no. No, not at all. Uh, I had absolutely no idea how to even spell it. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, Adi, uh, so the next day, Brian, who's uh, Adi's son that plays in the NHL now, had been drafted. So he's got to be 14 at that point, maybe, 14 or 15. And he had been drafted by the Quebec Junior Hockey League, which is a pretty big deal. And Adi was going up there to check things out, you know, because that would have, I think he would have had, had he decided to take that route, Brian would have had to go up into Canada and, you know, give up his amateur status and all of that. And I got the feeling that Adi was really trying to, you know, put things in order which is, geez, I can't imagine I'm getting a little emotional thinking about it. But, you know, he was, he was getting things in order. He wanted to do as much for Brian, you know, in case, uh, yeah, in case something, you know, that it, things went the wrong way. Well, Kevin Gill came to my house, my brother-in-law, Rita's husband, and he was trying to find a way to help me. And Artie wasn't there. Artie had left for a weekend in Canada with Brian and sick. He still picked it all up, packed up. He was going to go and live until the last minute. So we took Brian to Canada uh, on a hockey trip and Kevin sat in my office and he said, where can we go and where can we take him? So the two girls were chatting away and I went in on the computer and I'm like fooling around trying to find out information again. Now I didn't even know how to spell it. So I'm in there for a little bit 
and I got nowhere, right? So we're driving back home, and Rita's like, what, what were you doing? And I'm t- saying to her, well, you know, I was trying to find Medjugorje and this and that, and um, I think I actually shared with her the story about Robbie for the first time on that ride back from Judy's. And of course, we go back to our computer, and it's late Friday night now, and Rita's on there for like 30 seconds, and she pulls up the website for Medjugorje, which is not surprising. But um, anyhow, um, so the next morning, I got up, and um, we've had, at that point, we had five kids, and we get, you know, Saturdays, every single one of them is involved with some sport, you know, so we are going five different directions on especially on a Saturday and I remember and usually you know Rita is Rita quarterbacks the house so to speak and I'd be the guy out doing the various sporting events I'd show up and it would be all right this one's got to go here or there and she's feeding them in between and this and that oftentimes she's going in a different direction I um yeah so I I put up a strike that morning apparently and I um I didn't participate in any of the kids activities and I spent like in in this this you know you got to understand so the internet was just becoming uh you know popular then or even it was it was in its infancy stages and I was definitely even today I'm not a surfer I don't you know I I'm on for email or or and I use it more and more but I'm it just doesn't appeal to me to surf the net so uh, I don't however that morning um you know I don't know whether you say now it's holy spirit driven or what but I spent like uh I'm an early riser, so I got on it right away until the early afternoon, and I was just reading as much as I could, and I was so enthralled about Medjugorje that uh, early afternoon I decided to call my travel agent to see, like, can you get flights from here to there and this and that, and I'm kind of... uh, you know, this this idea is kind of um, trickling in my head. Now, Adi's still in Canada, and um, I decided to give Robbie a call. And he called me and said, uh, let's go. I'm buying tickets to go to Medjugorje. Let's take, let's take Adi to Medjugorje. And I said, I remember saying, Kevin, this, you know, I'm I'm busy. I'm, 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 I got a business to run. I, said, I, I just can't drop everything and go to Medjugorje. I don't want to put you in a bad position, Rob, but you're the guy that told me about it. You told me how you really wanted to go. You know, I I feel kind of bad not inviting you. However, I don't want to make you feel like you have to go so that if you don't, like I won't even tell anybody I ever invited you, you know, because I wanted to give him a gracious out and I didn't really want to put him on the spot. Which I didn't, those were unfounded fears, to be honest with you, because he says to me, he goes, let me talk to Kath, his wife, and I'll give you a call back within the hour. And then I just, something, I was just overcome with uh, feeling like I, sh- I should go. And it was more empathy for Artie than anything else. I think although there was a calmness about it, because I'm a, you know, I'm a type A personality. I don't have a lot of, I don't project a lot of calmness generally. And... Uh, uh, there was a calmness about it. My wife immediately said, no, you've got to go. Well, doesn't he call me back like 10 minutes later? I'm in. And and I was talking about leaving like five or six days later. Kevin never waited. He just was uh, impulsive. And, and uh, he bought us three tickets, first class tickets. that were leaving Sunday. And, and he's like the president of Cushman Wakefield. He has this enormous job. He runs a very big business and we're talking about dropping everything and going and the following so we went Sunday to Sunday the following Wednesday ID was to be uh, operated on so so there wasn't a whole lot of time here so I said to Rob it looks like uh, you know here's 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 what I've kind of got figured out by my guy and he's like well I know this sister Margaret and she can help us with some housing so I'll give her a call Adi has no idea about this at this point. Yeah, he comes home on Sunday, and I'm saying, listen, I think we're going to go to Medjugorje in, in a week or so. And uh, he was like, okay, let's go. It was a desperate time. Uh, Kevin and Robbie had decided to take me to Medjugorje, and we went as a last resort. This was it. 
It was a last resort. There's no doubt about that. It was, um, yeah, they were the medical, you know, again, the medical community, they were just going to cut it out, you know, and then, and then so we were coming back and Artie was supposed to get operated on the day of my birthday, the Triumph of the Cross, September 14th, and I think we got back on the 12th, so we must have, you know, we, like, we left the 5th or the 6th and we were back on the 12th, and, uh, and he was going to have surgery, you know, 48 hours later. I think for um, the wives, watching our husbands go to Bosnia, and they were not in the military, you know, <laughs> and um, seek a healing, a desperately seek a healing, leaving all of your family and your children behind to seek this one moment with God, you know, and, and knowing that you're risking, you know, risking it, but, and putting yourself out there, but willing to do that. It was like sending somebody off to war, war in a lot of ways. You know, how, how emotional are you when they're, when they're getting on the plane and they're gonna leave? And it was life and death, you know, situation for Artie. So I think it was emotional because everybody knew how, you know, important this was and how much um, we had put into this and how much the men had put into this, leaving their businesses and, you know, their families and going to this, underprivileged country that was a war zone at one point and you know it, it was emotional because who brought us here you know we, we're thinking our lives were just perfect you know last year and it came so far to this point that we were in a in a desperate state and weak you know weak and vulnerable so I guess and especially for the men because the men don't like to be vulnerable so I think the men were very vulnerable at the time and that was very hard for us to see that they were so vulnerable. There ended up being 40 or 50 or 60 people like gathered over there, family and friends saying goodbye to us. And ah, these, all the three of us are off for the spiritual journey. And it was just like, talk about heart wrenching. That's when the first tears started is, is, is uh, you know, our wives are there in tears saying goodbye to us. And it was just overwhelming. Honestly, I think back on it, and it's, I can put myself right there, and it's very, um, yeah, very overwhelming. We went over to the Boyle's house. My wife drove me over. Those 13 kids of Adi's were all there. There was a lot of crying. And I remember, you know, being um, uh, there and, you know, gave my wife and my, my daughter was with me at the time a kiss goodbye, which is very emotional because first time going away from the family. But there, there, their, uh, the Boyle family was, you know, desperately hoping and, and uh, for, for Artie. I mean, it was just, it was very sad because at that point, Artie's skin was, it was a it was sickly grayish green. He had lost 40 pounds. I, 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 I wasn't sure. I said to myself and probably to Kevin, I'm not even sure he's strong enough to make this trip, you know. So and I remember feeling just so, you know, badly coming, uh, leaving. I was almost emotional thinking about it. He, he was weak and uh, he was drawn and, and weak and he was, um, you know, I think he was more, it was wearing on, this news had to be wearing on him. I mean, it just had to be, that I think was worse than anything. You know, emotionally he was in a, a bad place, but you know, he's not, He's a typical guy's guy. He's not going to go like, we, we don't talk about feelings, you know? Well, we certainly didn't back then. We'd be more apt to today, certainly. But, uh, you know, that wouldn't have been something we would really have discussed. Um, it was almost like, uh, is he going over there to die or that sort of thing? And, um, and then we got in the limo to, to leave and you know, waving goodbye in the back. And it was just very emotional. When he went, he was uh, depressed. And I think. You, you probably, you look your worst when you're depressed. Depression is a, is a real, you know, disease. It's not something that you can just slough off and be done with. He, he had a grip on him of that downheartedness. And he was not his typical happy self. And the kids were frightened, you know, and to have him going to Bosnia, because at that time it, it wasn't like it is now. You know, they still had uh, tanks, going around over there and so it, he was going into an unsafe area we figured nobody really knew where we were going 
We actually brought a suitcase full of food and water because we had no idea where we were going. We didn't know if they had water or food or, you know, we hadn't known enough about it yet. I, I really felt as if there wasn't a lot to lose here. I was already at the point where we've hit bottom. There's only one way out of this now. We're either having surgery and or we're having a miracle. We got on the plane and uh, it was an overnight flight. And I remember talking to Kevin and saying, geez, Artie looks terrible. You know, there was no sleeping on the plane for Artie. He was just driven. I think, I don't know if he even slept on the way over. He, I slept and Kevin slept and I kept waking up and there he was reading, praying, Artie praying his tail off. Again, I had not known what to expect when we got to Medjugorje uh, in terms of what we're going into, a little village, no paved roads, no food and water. Uh, we hadn't, I hadn't read up enough on it. But uh, on the plane ride over, I, I started to get a sensation or a feeling that I was going to someplace very special. In June of 1981, six children in the tiny village of Medjugorje, in what was then Yugoslavia, reported seeing a vision of the Virgin Mary on a hillside. She told them that she had come to let the world know that God exists, and that through Him, each person could find healing and peace. The visions continued every evening, and within days attracted thousands of people from the surrounding area who came to witness for themselves the miracles that were happening. A number of people, including a young child dying of septicemia and an old man who had been blind since birth, were completely healed during the visions. These are rare photographs documenting the fourth day of the apparitions on the hill. The visionaries who ranged in age from 10 to 17 when the apparitions began have continued to see and speak with the Virgin Mary each day since that time. And through the years, the once tiny village has been visited by over 40 million pilgrims who have traveled from all over the world to seek out spiritual and physical healings. Each arrives with a story, and each leaves with a miracle. So all of us have a story, a story that is very intimate and very personal, and that only God fully knows, and He has the knowledge of these mysteries. So there is a, a permanent, lasting mark on the lives of each of those people present here. So it was very understandable that this uh, person in America or anywhere in the world hearing about this uh, wonderful word coming from heaven, wonderful story of we need to go there. We need to go there. We all kept um, diaries that we began. Someone gave us diaries. Please keep a diary, which I've never had in my life. So we all kept diaries, plane ride, first night, second night. So this is all pretty much documented by all three of us. And um, when we got there, uh, Sister Margaret had set us up with uh, one of the guides, Jelka, who was Visca, one of the apparitionist um, cousins. And she had taken us... Uh, to uh, obviously around to see the shrine to St. James. We got to church. First time to going to church, we, the rosary was being, was being uh, sung by you know, a couple thousand people in the church. It was very, very moving, something I'd never seen here in this country. Um, you could hear it from you know, half a mile away, and uh, it was incredible. The place was jam-packed, they were praying the rosary and they sang the Ave Maria between the decades. It literally squeezed in with all the people and they sang with such conviction that I knew I was in the right place in Medjugorje. 
my soul just immediately lifted. But I was still depressed, still anxious, still scared, had no idea what was going to happen. And we came down that night and unfortunately Jelko says I got very bad news for you that uh, Visca is not going to be here for the trip. She's not going to be able to pray over you. And, and we, you know, we, we, I think that we were shaken up, to be honest with you. I think we were kind of, oh, wow, well, that's, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. And Visca was leaving to, uh, to take care of a, a nun who was sick, had become sick, and she was going to take care of her. In, in the readings that we had done and in our talking with each other, we had, um, we, we had figured out that it had been a really long time since our last confession. And combined, it had been oh, decades since our last confession. I, I would say to you that the three of us, no matter what anybody might say, there were no altar boys in the group. You know, there, there were no choir boys. I was, um, you know, a hockey player growing up. I had seven broken noses. I was constantly looking for trouble as a kid. I did have, my formation was, you know, my mom and dad went to church on Sundays. I did go. I had uh, become very close to my future father-in-law, who's my role model. So I'd been to church. I had a very uh, strong um, uh, Catholic guilt complex about going to church on Sunday, right? So that was my, it was either that when I was at BC, I went to Boston College. I would go on um, uh, Sunday nights because there were a lot of pretty girls there. I always went to church ended up hearing the sermon, for whatever reason or not, so I was there. But I was by anything but uh, a choir boy. You know, we're all kind of type A personalities, the three of us, and we're also like black and white. You know, in order to, like, if you do this, this, and this, this is what's gonna happen, you know? And if you follow these steps, here's what's gonna happen. And, you know, in, in, in Our Lady's messages from Medjugorje, she, you know, there's, there's, some pro, you know, there's some promises and some graces that, that are kind of promised if you follow these steps. And one of those steps was to go to monthly confession. And it was very obvious to the three of, you know, to the three of us that, that this is probably a pretty good place for us to start. And we all um, decided, you know, we all went to confession. And, because we were trying to do exactly what we were supposed to do. And, and now I know that, you know, if you go into a confession and you don't intentionally leave a sin out, but you just forget about it, you're still absolved of that sin, as long as it's not intentional. Well, back then, I didn't completely, I had forgotten that. I'm sure I was taught that during, as a child and during my confirmation, but, you know, so during the course of that next day, I was like, oh, son of a gun, I forgot about that one. Or, or you know, I'm thinking of myself, you know, jeepers, you know, and, and it wasn't that I held it back. I had just forgot about it. So the next night, after the service again, I said to Roddy and Robbie, you know, Geez, I, uh, I'm gonna go back in, you know, I, and they're like, what do you mean? You've been with us all day, you've been fine, you didn't, you know, you haven't sinned today, you're good, come on, we gotta go eat. I'm like, no, no, I'm gonna go back. And Kevin uh, looked over at the confessionals and said, you know, I think I forgot a couple of things. I'm gonna go back to confession. I go in and, you know, there's all these, these different priests hearing him in different languages, and. There's no line for the English, and I scoot right in there, and I sit down and I start my confession with a gentleman, a priest named Father Simon Cadwallada from Liverpool, England. And I can best, and I, and I explained to him that, you know, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been about 24 hours since my last confession, which is a good way to start it off. You know, it's the truth, and uh, off we go. And he... Um, I best describe it this way, is Simon reached into me and took my heart in his hands and massaged it and reinserted it, if that makes any sense to anybody. And he finally burst through the door, claiming that there was this incredible priest in the confessional that we had to go and see him. So we went running back down the Main Street, Medjugorje, with three guys that hadn't been to confession in over 15 years to go to a, back to confession. And we finally met the priest. When I got in to see him, you know, when I had come over here, I was full of anxiety and depression. They told me I was going to die. I had less than 5% chance to live. 
go home, put my house in order. So I could barely put one foot in front of the other without all kinds of bad things going through my head. And when I went into that confessional, and Father Simon explained to me that the most powerful medicine we have on earth is Jesus in the Eucharist, and to take the Eucharist as often as possible into your heart and ask Jesus to heal you. That and a lot of other stuff we talked about in the confessional that was very normal conversation. It was wonderful. And when I left the confessional, I realized the anxiety was gone. The depression was gone. I felt free as a bird. And, and, I, and I immediately knew that it wasn't, I wasn't here in Medjugorje so much to be physically healed, but to be spiritually healed. We had this um, incredible uh, confession and we all started to feel much differently after confession. Artie feels like I'm really open. I'm open, much more open to my, um, to my, uh, to a potential healing. So maybe it's okay that I didn't. Uh, he started right away. Maybe it's okay that I didn't. We don't see Visca. Uh, you know, the confession was important to him, and Kevin was really affected by the by the confession. Um, so the next morning, we end up going. We we're, again, we're sort of we're we're, we're sort of. Um, on fire at this point, right? So, and again, these are three hockey players, golfers, you know, don't have the sweetest mouth on the world, uh, on, on the rink or on the golf course, especially me. I don't want to throw those two under the bus, but, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, sort of truck driver sort of mentality. We had a wonderful guy named Jelka. Jelka was Visca's cousin, and she had, we were supposed to be prayed over, I was supposed to be prayed over by Visca, and Visca is the visionary in charge of praying for the sick, so to speak. And uh, we had some bad news on our first night that Visca wouldn't be here. The next day we got up and went to Mass, and uh, Jelka said to us, what would you like to do now? And we talked about maybe, um, you know, buying a souvenir for our wives, which I don't know where we came up with that right out of the gate. But, uh, and so there we are shopping in this jewelry store, which between the three of us, I think like, all of us about five minutes in any store and we start getting the hives but um you know we were we, we were we were in the store for a while and in that jewelry store we spent 45 minutes three grown men and this thing's a tiny little store and three grown men trying to buy jewelry so i had bought five rosary bracelets for my daughters and i was looking at the gold crosses and chains for my sons and i was thinking this is expensive but I said to myself, if I could spend the money I spend on golf and hockey and all the money I waste on ancillary things, then I could certainly spend it on Jesus. That thought went through my head. And all of a sudden, there's this little commotion going off to our left, and it's not a very big jewelry store. And I look over, and I said to Robbie, that's Visca, because I recognized her from the pictures in the book. Kevin came over and put his arm around me, and he said, do you know who that is standing right next to you? And I, I looked. It was a small woman. I said, no. It was Visca. She had missed her plane from the night before, happened to stop at this jewelry store to buy a rosary ring for her sick friend, and she now was standing next to me. And Jelka says, Visca, this, this, these, are the, these are the Americans that I told you about. They were, they were coming over to see you. Would you mind you know, talking to them and praying over them? So she's immediately, you know, she's just the sweetest, you know, lightest you've, you've met her, I'm sure. Um, and she, she sort of dropped everything. She said, sure, she started talking. She made, very, made uh, you know, very pleasant conversation. She said, let's pray. And this little tiny woman uh, put her hand on my head, and it was such a grip, I'll never forget it. You know, she's not a, a big girl. She's, she's kind of, you know, slender and, and even maybe a little frail. But she grabbed Addie, you know, she's praying over Addie like this. And, and Robbie, I'm on one side with my hand on, on Addie's shoulder. And, and Addie's, and Robbie's on the other with his hand on Addie's shoulder. And Visker has got a claw-like grasp on Addie. And like, you could just see her forearms are, are somewhat like even pumped up. And she is praying. And all of a sudden, and I know the same thing happened to Robbie, because again, we shared later, but there was this warmth that just came right through. It must have came through Artie's body, you know, through my arm and right through, you know, it was right, right through where you, where you were praying over it and just, you were washed with this warmth that was, uh, it was hot. I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing. My uh, t-shirt was soaking wet, so, from the heat. So um, it was, un so that just that, I, I said, you know, oh my God, what, what just happened, you know? So 
I, um, uh, you know, Kevin and I are looking at one another, and and Artie again is starting to, you know, sort of, he's just much more loose about it. He, he was, he was um, so full of consternation, obviously, when he was there, and so um, deliberate in his praying, and but you know. You know, concerned obviously for for his family and his life, obviously as anyone would be, but he was starting to relax. He was starting to feel better, and almost immediately he started to look better. Well, we left there. We went up to the top of Krishovitz, and on the way up the mountain in the rain, I could feel a pain in my lung, and I started thinking to myself, "Man, this is getting worse." We prayed the stations on the way up as as you were as we were guy you know as we were somebody somebody told us what we should be doing again we were looking for give us the steps and we'll do the steps you know and but then nobody said you pray like we were praying on the top of that mountain then from what i understand later now Adi did not share this with us at this point in time but he was feeling pain and he's thinking of himself Jeepers, is this getting better or getting worse? And we got to the top and we're crying, you know, because it really starts to hit home. Like, you don't want to leave this earth. You love it so much. And we're asking Jesus for a miracle. We were the only ones up at the top. And uh, we were at the cross. And we, uh, we, 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 I've never done this before in a mass or any place else. We held hands and we almost were screaming, dear Lord, please heal this man. We ask, we seek, we knock. And we were saying these things, we were saying prayers that I had never known before, you know, it was just coming out these prayers. The three of us were crying, and uh, again, this enormous sense of peace came over the three of us. That was, of all the moments, even the, the, the Visco, moment. That moment was the one that I, I, I recall most clearly. It was just the three of us, but you have to understand that we were up there. We were claiming his miracle. We were, we were praying as earnestly as we could pray, thinking that it mattered, like if, if we prayed with the most effort that we could muster. We were uh, crying in prayer and, 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 and you know, calling out from the bottom, like, please, Lord, please, we ask you to please heal this man, this good man, this father, 13 children, this wonderful uh, husband, to a very faithful wife. Please, dear Lord, please heal him. And again, from, from people, from hockey players who had never used that language before, the vernacular was completely foreign. Um, and um, we just opened our you know, hearts and souls up to, to Christ. And um, you know, that was, for me, just, it was, I, I can't. I can't put in words. What, you know what? What happened then? What made it special for me was the effort that we were putting in. It was just uh, crazy. And then the um, three of us, we just bolted right down the mountain at, at the end of us because darkness was coming quick, and we weren't going to be able to see the way down the mountain. When we climbed the mountain, and when we spent a moment in prayer. And that is the moment of grace uh, to encounter ourselves. A and in this deep area of ourselves, in the depth of our being, God has placed the most wonderful things that we never discover. There are physical healings and there are uh, uh, mental healings and there, there are cyclic healings. Uh, I, I'm here right now f for about 10 years in Medjugorje after, I, after being provincial in Mostar and so I'm regularly on a daily basis in the, in the confessional for hours and hours and, and you, you experience there how, how the people are healed. How, how something is going out of them and how how they they feel relaxed how they feel the grace coming into them and how they feel uh, that they are changed for some reason the people come here i know they don't come here because of me <laughs> you know or you they come here because of god you know they want to meet god here and they do meet god here through adorations at night going to daily mass 
going confession, climbing the hills. Many people, especially those that are in a, you know, kind of good shape, they go like uh, four o'clock in the morning when there is nobody, peaceful. They say the rosary and stay up there. And God just touched their hearts, and I know that because they come home and they're different. As we came back that night, as we were coming in, Adi was moving very slowly when we first got there. Adi's got a jump in his step. He's leading. He's walking in front of Kevin and I. And I put my hand on Kevin's shoulder and said, I'm telling you, he's healed. I'm telling you right now, he's healed. You, you could see that he was getting better. Like he was more lively. He was vibrant. Again, like I told you, we, we were worried because I was worried because... Um, you know, I thought he'd come back. I, that, that kidney surgery that he had had way back, that kicked the crap out of him. I mean, that was a big surgery, and that was, I think that was kind of little compared to what he had coming up. So we, I was a little worried that we're going to bring him in, and he's going to be all drawn out and exhausted from this trip, having to undergo this major surgery. So I was a little bit concerned about that. And then he doesn't sleep at all on the way over, just spends the whole night up reading the reading and stuff and on the, on the plane. But uh, um, I felt that he was getting like, um, we all were, we were on fire. That's the best I can describe it. And it wasn't just Robbie. I mean, I, it was Robbie, too, and myself, you know. So we were on fire, is how I can. And the fire, it was, you know, the flame started like this in, on, in hour one. And by hour 150 or whatever, it was just a roaring blaze. And that's how it, it's just every little thing kind of built upon it. Here in Bezgoda, is, everything is, is packed with grace. Grace is, is uh, something uh, uh, the people say they feel it physically. Here on the church or on the pleasure on the on the operation hill. Because where there, where, where, where there are so many prayers, there is, there is an uh, energy. At the top of that mountain, something was happening. A conversion experience, I don't know what. But I called my wife when I got down from the mountain and I said, something is happening here in Medjugorje. Please call the doctor and schedule another CT scan because when I land, four days later, they're taking out my right lung. She called the doctor. The doctor's secretary called back and on my voicemail left a message saying, uh, Mr. Boyle, we know you're in Medjugorje. That's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. But the fact is you have cancer and it's not going to disappear. So we're going to go ahead with the operation. My wife did what any good wife would do. She got another doctor. And I, I will never forget, nor will my sister Rita, when they got there and they went up to the top of the mountain and they were praying together, the three men, Robbie Griffin and, and Kevin Gill and, and my husband, and they were crying and begging and asking God to heal Artie. We got a phone call at the end of, of the whole thing and they said, we just would like you to know that she's really here. He said to me, if I die now, I'm good. And he said, in fact, I think maybe you should bring the family here instead of me coming back to you. <laughs> and what I found out by being in Medjugorje through the days, I was here for 10 days. And when I first got here, I was very anxious, didn't know what to expect. And as the days went on and I got to go pray, and on one night I literally went to the top of Apparition Hill alone and lie prostrate top of that mountain and looked up at the stars and said to Jesus, take me now, I'll never be in this state of peace again. And I had gotten to such a state of peace through prayer, meditation, no confusion, no radio, no newspaper, no TV, that I was at such peace that I believe I actually went for a period of days without sinning, which is almost it's impossible normally, but I felt I had done that. And I was at the top of the mountain and I prayed to Jesus to take me. I'll never feel this peace again. I love my wife and children, of course, and I didn't want to leave them, but I knew what a great gift awaited me. And then when we were getting on the plane to leave, Adi turned to me and said, you know, thanks so much uh, for you and Kevin, and I just want you guys to know, no matter what happens, I'm completely at peace with it. 
no matter whether I was healed or I wasn't, I'm completely, I almost can't talk about what Chuck choked me up when he said it because I sort of felt that way too. I mean, I just felt, hey, you know, we're ready. He's not going to get, we've been to confession three or four times. Uh, we had learned to pray, pray the rosary. We had um, been to mass twice a day. So when we were coming back, it was going to be a successful trip, irregardless of whether Adi was physically healed. Because, you know, the bond that was created between the three of us, it was unbelievable. And we had all had a spiritual healing. You know, Robbie with his dad, maybe he was a little bit more at peace with his dad, you know. And Adi with uh, with forgiveness, you know, he needed he needed to get, to get through some forgiveness in his life, which he was able to do. And and me with just you know, I needed to be closer to God, and and I and I probably had some forgiveness in my life also, you know. God, for some reason, touches people. So people open their hearts. And God touches their hearts. Period. It's very simple. And when that happened, that people cry, people go barefoot, they climb mountains. They start fasting. And so it's not a matter of me. So magic is not because of me and you and priests. And it's because of God. God wants life. God wants happiness. And we are called to be in service of happiness, of our own happiness and happiness of our, our people, all those who come to us. People come here looking for something. And uh, local people you know, guides, priests, nuns, we try to help them. And, you, and we, never, we never push people here, you know. We just tell them what's going on and we tell them, and, and, and you know, and God does the rest. We just kind of guide them and tell them, you know, and God does the rest. Through the sacrament of confession, I would say, because the magic is probably the biggest confession box in the world, probably. He had been spiritually healed. He had come to terms, but he also knew that uh, there was a chance he had been healed. Enough so that they ended up, you know, he, he wanted another CAT scan before they sliced him completely open. The surgery was scheduled already, so when he came back from Medjugorje, two days later, he was going out three days later into, into surgery. So I wanted them before, because he had been to Medjugorje, to scan him, but they were adamantly against that. Judy called Mass General, you know, number one hospital uh, in the world for these kinds of things. She said, listen, would you mind, uh, you know, if Artie had another CAT scan? And they said, Mrs. Boyle, it's, you know, fine that you have your faith. But, you know, truth be told, you, he's the father of 13. Your daughter's a doctor. He's had more CAT scans than pr maybe any patient we've ever had at, at Mass General. And so it's great you have your faith. Keep saying your prayers. Make sure he doesn't eat anything. He's going to have a very serious operation. We're going to cut open his ribs. We're going to take out his lung. You know, he, he can't, he's got to be ready. And she said, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm not coming in unless, unless we give it one more time. So I then called um, the, th the thoracic floor at Mass General Hospital. And the um, nurse practitioner picked up the phone. And lo and behold, she lived at the end of Artie Street growing up. And she said to me, Judy, it's Marion. And I said, Marion? And she said, I get a pencil, write down this name. This is who you're going to call. When I heard Marion's voice and her give me the name of Matt Smith, I just thought, you're on my side, God. I know you're helping me here. And he called uh, Matt Smith, went in to see him. And when he went in to see Matt Smith, there was a picture of St. James Church in Medjugorje on the wall. And he said, where did you get that picture? And he said, oh, I sent my parents to Medjugorje. He had sent his parents to Medjugorje and had a picture of Medjugorje hanging on his office wall. I said, this is the right guy. And they rescanned him. And after the scan, the three, the surgeon and um, the other doctors, there was a team of doctors that consulted. You know, they had Artie's x-rays and scans all over the wall. He's in going back and forth. I think he was in there for two or three hours. I thought he would be scanned and then they'd call us. That's what my thought was. But um, they called him right in and he was actually waiting for him standing in the door because I think they were as surprised, you know, as they could be thinking this, this is not what we were expecting. 
And one of the doctors, you know, said, you know, put your clothes on and went into the office and the doctor literally was scratching his head and said, Mr. Boyle, you can go home now. It's gone. You're, you're, you're healed. And it showed that uh, the problems that we had, the three tumors, one had disappeared completely, two shrunk to almost undetectable sizes. And I can remember I was on the ice at a practice with the kids that uh, late that afternoon, and there he is. Uh, you know, he came by and shared the good news that, uh, you know, that it was gone. When he called and said, they're, they're gone, you know, it was like someone just put a pin in the water balloon because it was like, I just like re let it all go. And then I kept thinking, did he really say that? Did he, re you know, because you have to keep pinch me. Is this really true? Did I dream this? Artie called me himself. So he called me and told me what happened. I know right where I was sitting at my desk and, and, uh, and uh, I just began to cry. The, the hair st stood up on my arm. And, uh, and as I told you, I, I think of the three of us, I was completely convinced he was going to be healed. I was sure he was healed. I kept saying it to Kevin. Maybe it was wishful thinking, I don't know. But when, when you, still, when you get the confirmation, when you had that phone call, it brings you to your back down to your knees and you're, you know, you just, you know, my eyes filled up and, and uh, you know, I went out, got my wife and, and you know, told her. And, and uh, I think it was, you know, more than likely the highlight of my entire life, that, that, that uh, phone call, because, you know, it meant that trip meant so much to me, meant so much to my family, meant so much to his family, that uh, uh, I knew from that, you know, when I hung that phone, my life was different from that, from that point on. Look at me now, years later, you know, it's like, that was, um, well, it was what we had been praying for, wasn't it, you know, and our prayers were answered. Certainly, God put the finishing touch on his good work that he had done with us. So, um, you know, it was, uh, it was confirmation what I felt was going to take place based on our experience over there. But uh, it's awfully good to have it confirmed and hear it. The realization of knowing that your prayers are answered and that you're... Um, You know, that your best friend's got a, another shot at life here. You know, he's given a, he's given another, you know, he's got a new deck of cards to play now. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty overwhelming actually. And here it is, look at all this time later, I still get, you know, because I, I can live, I, I can remember coming off the ice and him saying, he's got this big smile on his face. So with the surgery on September 14th, the Feast of the Triumph of the Cross, Instead of cutting out my right lung, I was playing golf with Robbie and Kevin, and they canceled the surgery. Which is full circle for the men. I mean, can you imagine? You've got one week, you're depressed. You think you're going to, you know, have this terrible surgery. They tell you that, it, you know, the chances of you surviving for a long period of time are not good. And the following week, the surgery's been canceled, so they go out and golf. Men, it's just a, a man thing, you know. You could even hear in his voice a difference. You know, before he left, when he got the diagnosis of the nodules, he sounded defeated. And he, he said even, um, which, you know, he never admits really worries, you know. Um, but he, he even said, what, what am I going to do? You know, what's, what's going to happen? What am I gonna... And I, I think that that was, I've only ever seen him cry once, ever, you know. And I've only ever seen him really upset a couple of times. He's very strong. And he... Um, that was difficult, but then when he came back, he, he was energized and he was full of hope and he was sure that they were gone. You know, he didn't need the scans. And then when I would talk to him about, okay, this is what you need to do after, just in case it comes back, you know, and I kept saying this interferon, this experimental, you know, all these things, like just in case it comes back. Because there's still that part of me that was like, I don't want you ever to get this again. And now it came back and, you know, but it didn't happen to me. It happened to him. And he said, I am cured. I'm healed. There's no question. But what if, you know, and he says, no, no, what if? I'm healed. I know that God touched me and I am healed. I was healed. I didn't know why. It's a very humbling thing. Um, when, I, when I think about it and try to make sense of it, I can't, so I just kind of go with it. 
from a medical point of view, there isn't anything else that healed him. There isn't, it doesn't happen where you have a spread cancer that then becomes encapsulated and you know, you don't have lung metastasis that just go away. You just don't, they just don't. It's not, unless you have some other factor, it just doesn't happen, especially in a male who's older. There's no medical explanation for it. And if you say, well, the doctors made a mistake, well, look at the scans. They're there, you know, they're there. The information is on the scans. Did you ever see the scans? I did. Before and after? I did see the scans, yeah. I was in the office with the surgeon with them at one point, yeah. And there were nodules that were growing and then there weren't. There was nothing to be said, you know. <laughs> it's like, you can't just make it go away for, for nothing. And it wasn't that it, they just went away. They went away when he went to Medjugorje. You know, it's not like they went away over a year and a half and they just kind of slowly resolved. They didn't. They, they were there, they were growing, and then a week later or whatever, two weeks, they were gone. You know, and that's the part I think that was sort of um, really impacted us all. And so he was energized from our point of view after that and, and felt um, so grateful. And I made a promise to the Blessed Mother that I would give witness to the healing power of her son whenever I was asked. And I've never said no yet. It's been 13 years. There are a lot of people who don't believe and they think that science cannot coexist with um, religion. They think you have to be ignorant. You know, if, really, you have to be ignorant. It's people just use religion to comfort themselves. And it's not a real thing. It's just chemicals in your brain that go off. And um, what I came to believe was that there were a couple of things in play. One was an arrogance. You know, if you feel that you really know everything, you really are in trouble. You know, and as a physician, it's even worse. You better know how much you don't know or you're going to be in trouble, you know. Um, and then besides the arrogance, I think also um, there's a fear some people have of, of what they don't understand. And of course, God is so almighty that we could never understand God, you know. And so when people who are scientific minded, who are brilliant, who are used to understanding everything, think, you know, think about something that doesn't make complete sense to them or they can't understand every aspect of, well, of course it must be fantasy. And that's unfortunate because God created science. And religion is really simple. There is a God, you go to church and pray, period. You know, he never said that you can't watch soccer or you guys Super Bowl finals and stuff, you know? So God is your best buddy. We knew when he was healed that it was something that God had allowed to happen so that he could continue to bless more and more and more people. It's not about the healing of Artie Boyle. It's about the hand of God and how he can touch everyone. And it's not me. One of the problems we have to realize it's not, we, we, we have to stay humble. And it's very easy to get, you know, to fool yourself. It has nothing to do with me. He's just using me as an example of his power. Being the kind of physician that I am and my husband, we have a practice of our own, you get as much information as you can and you use as many techniques and therapies as you can. Um, well, what we've learned over the years, and even then is, you know, prayer is not a last resort. It's, um, you know, people say, oh, I did this and I did that and I did this and I guess I'll just pray. You know, and it's, it's unfortunate because there's tremendous power in prayer and you really should use it as one of your first tools, not really one of your last tools. It's been, um, what, 13 years now, uh, at least. And um, when I look back, I, I wish I could have been more confident and more holy boldness, but that's not where God had me at the time. God had me at a very weak time and in my weakness, He was strong. He left me here to prove to people that it was possible. So I was spiritually healed. I understood what that meant. That was my gateway to heaven. The physical healing you need in order to stay here on earth. And when I received the physical healing by having the cancer disappear, then I knew I had to tell people. Once that healing happened and there was that sort of real resolution that defied all science, that was just this real thing that happened, um, I think a lot of more people sort of took notice. We have a, a need now to take what we have been given and to um, take it to the ends of the earth, to let everybody that wants to hear, hear the story. And we're both committed to it, that you know we'll put everything else down and we'll tell the story. Because it blesses people and it's the truth. And it's not a story I would have ever written. <laughs> it isn't something I was signing up for. <laughs> Believe me, I didn't think I had the courage to be able to live 
through it. Um, but I, I can look now and say, you know, God chose Artie for a reason and a purpose, and Artie stepped up and, and did what he needed to do, and God is still using Artie in a very profound way. On the plane ride over, I, I had written into my journal, I'm going to Medjugorje to be healed and to see the Blessed Mother. And though I may not actually see her, I know I'll be touched by her in some way. And then I would later find out that faith is the confident assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things yet unseen. And I had written in that book, The Confident Assurance of Things Hoped For. And I would get, when I returned, the evidence of things yet unseen. So I had written faith into my journal. This is a human story. And this is a story that God wants for each and every one of us. He doesn't want anything else but you and me to be happy. That's everything. That's all the commitment of God for you and for me to be happy. And he's uh, in Medjugorje providing us the, with the tools, with mechanism, with ways, with guidance, with leadership, showing us the path, the ways, how to be, how to be happy and how to be uh, successful, really successful in the most meaningful way of the word, how to be, live a successful life. What it did for me on that first trip is uh, I define it as the most peaceful place on earth that I had ever been to. I had a peace within me that I'd never experienced before. We are exploding with needs. We, we are, as I said, made to need. So we, we, we we really need to build into our lives these wonderful stories, wonderful moments. These are moments of grace uh, that will somehow stay as these little sparks that may explode again and again sometime in the future. My healing in uh, Medjugorje has, uh, has had a profound effect on my family. Uh, we pray the rosary. We never pray the rosary. We go to Mass almost. My wife goes pretty much daily. I go most days, uh, things that we had never done before. We started a prayer group in 2001 that has affected many, many lives. Um, all of our friends have been impacted and affected. The entire community around where we live has been impacted and affected. So my healing has had a tremendous impact on not only my family, not only my community, but it has been exponential in how it's affected people. I didn't go over there looking for a spiritual conversion, but I know from that moment that I had that confession with Father Simon, you know, I was a different person, and I have been to this day, thank you, God. I've gone to Mass every single day since, and, uh, and I, I attribute any success that I've had in, in life, which uh, I've been blessed with, uh, to be, you know, a derivative of that trip. I think everybody that comes to Medjugorje receive some kind of a gift, whether it's a spiritual healing, a physical healing, emotional, whatever it is. And then as we go further, as we allow ourselves, as we uh, expose ourselves to the risk of being touched with the Holy Spirit, we become the fruits. The fruits are already there. Medjugorje is one of the most powerful places on earth. It's a place of supernatural peace. The three of us are on top of Cross Mountain by ourselves. There's just nobody else there. And it was a, a moment that turned into the most prayerful experience I've ever been a part of. And at the top of that mountain, we were able to pray and plead with God. And we wept and we embraced and uh, something wonderful happened at the top of that mountain.